is one Mitch McConnell, who ended his tenure today as the longest serving Senate leader in history. He'll be gone in a few months, but we're going to live with his legacy for a very long time. The question before us, what exactly is the price we'll all pay for the single greatest legacy of McConnell's 17 years as the head of Senate Republicans? That is, of course, the turbocharged conservative majority on the U.S. Supreme Court. There's also his legislative legacy. The bills passed under three presidents, including the vast majority of Trump's agenda. But towering over all of it, and likely to last long beyond McConnell's tenure and his life, is the work of the three justices whose nominations McConnell rammed through the Senate. Neil Gorsuch, Amy Coney Barrett, and Brett Kavanaugh, one of which, Gorsuch, happened only because McConnell denied then President Barack Obama an opportunity to appoint his justice. The three justices supply the majority that overturned Roe versus Wade, that wildly unpopular decision, overturned affirmative action in college admissions, derailed a plan to bring billions in student debt relief to Americans. We could go on and on. We cover all of this on this broadcast all the time. But the court is today, right now, dealing with a slew of incredibly consequential cases involving the current frontrunner for the Republican nomination, the disgraced, twice impeached, four times indicted ex-president Donald Trump. He is the same guy who McConnell enabled at every step of the way, all in order to cement that legacy on the courts. McConnell now steps down from his role as the linchpin of the Senate Republican caucus, with his party basically a vestige of an authoritarian movement attached to a man who disagrees with many of McConnell's long-held foreign policy views. McConnell even hinted at that distance between himself and the MAGA movement at his announcement today. It's why I worked so hard to get the national security package passed earlier this month. Believe me, I know the politics within my party at this particular moment in time. I have many faults. Misunderstanding politics is not one of them. So there's anything that sums up McConnell's relationship with Donald Trump and that MAGA movement and how it defines our politics today. It would be the moment he pinned the blame for the deadly insurrection on Donald Trump while in the same nanosecond voting to acquit him during that second impeachment trial. Former President Trump's actions preceded the riot for a disgraceful, disgraceful dereliction of duty. The House accused the former president of, quote, incitement. That is a specific term from the criminal law. Let me just put that aside for a moment and reiterate something I said weeks ago. There's no question, none, that President Trump is practically and morally responsible for provoking the events of the day. No question about it. That is where we start today with some of our favorite experts and friends. Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut is our guest. He sits on the Judiciary Committee, plus NYU law professor and former clerk to Judge Sonia Sotomayor. Melissa Murray is back. And back with me at the table, former U.S. Senator and co-host of MSNBC's How to Win 2024 podcast. Our friend Claire McCaskill is here. Claire, we start with you. We, we talked before the show a little bit and during that rather exciting technical meltdown. Um, what, you have so many professional and personal experiences, stories, interactions with McConnell. But what, what, what was your first thought today when you saw the announcement? That there's trouble in the caucus. Mm. I think he is. Um, it, here's what Mitch McConnell, Mitch cares mostly about power and his party. He is a traditional leader in that way. It's not really about Mitch. It's about that. He loves being in charge. But, and so what he's seeing right now is how can he facilitate getting a leader of the Senate that is not going to be crazy town? That's not going to be a Josh Hawley or a Ted Cruz or a Rand Paul, who I think all of whom have called him liars in public. I mean, there's real friction in the caucus at mm -hmm. this point. So I think he's trying to give enough time, knowing that he probably couldn't get reelected again. 
mm -hmm. if he wanted to be the leader for the next Congress, he probably couldn't get elected again. He's probably trying to give someone enough time to gather the votes and to do the things necessary. And I'm sure he's hopeful that is someone who is not in Trump's back pocket. And there are now a number of senators that are in Trump's back pocket. Mitch McConnell's not one of them. And frankly, most of the people running to replace him aren't either. Um, it's a crowded back pocket. Um, it's a crowded back pocket. <laughs> um, I, 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 I want to, I mean, look, at the, 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 the editorial choices we make are all a consequence of Trump's picks to the Supreme Court and McConnell's conduct in getting them confirmed, um, starting with his denial uh, of Merrick Garland, his seat on the, on the court. McConnell made the point himself that he's really good at reading politics. Do you think McConnell is aware that the reason he's a minority leader and not the majority leader is because of the court's decision on Dobbs? Uh, I think he he does know that he's responsible for Dobbs. I think we should not forget. I think we don't often enough talk about the dark money in politics. It is so corrosive, Nicole. I mean, people have no idea who are writing these million dollar checks, multi million dollar checks behind the curtain and trying to influence our politics. It is all in the dark. And that is almost 100 percent because of Mitch McConnell. And before Citizens United, he was railing against uh, McCain Feingold. Try, doing everything he could to stop it. Um, and, you know, if you, he loved Kavanaugh because Kavanaugh had written on the bench, he thought there should be no limits on any campaign laws at all, finance laws, that foreign interests ought to be able to give. So, the, and you know, he did a couple of things really strategically on the Supreme Court. First of all, the hypocrisy of him saying no to Merrick Garland and then pushing through Amy Comey Barrett right before the election. And secondly, he knew the Kavanaugh stuff in, in, in the year I was running was gonna cause big problems for people like me and Bill Nelson because it turned into such a controversial thing for states that were not bright blue. Senator Blumenthal, um, you, you sort of sit at this, this fulcrum of, of sort of sharing the, the legislative body with McConnell, but also dealing with a lot of the consequences of, of, of decisions that the court makes. What, are your, what were your first thoughts today when you saw the announcement? My first thought was that no person in recent history has had a more devastating malign effect on American civil rights and liberties, whether it's gun violence, or voting rights or women's reproductive rights than Mitch McConnell. He has enabled far right capture of the Supreme Court and not just of the nation's highest court, but all of the judiciary, one third of all the current judges sit on the judiciary by virtue of Mitch McConnell pushing them through. So it isn't just the hypocrisy of holding Merrick Garland for nine months and then ramming Amy Coney Barrett through in three weeks. It is a judiciary that is far right, activist and young. So they're going to be around for quite a while. And that judicial environment has changed the legal landscape in America. It's such a powerful, I mean, you cut through it much better than I was able to do in, in my two attempts um, to set up this conversation. But, but you're right to broaden it beyond Dobbs and beyond abortion. I mean, the inability to speak to the 85% of all Americans who would like to see gun safety legislation is because of not just the people who sit on the Supreme Court, but all of those other um, judges that McConnell's responsible for as well. Do you feel like we're in a different spot now where, th where the voting public is acutely aware that the Supreme Court and the federal judicial system is at a step with U.S. public opinion? I feel very, very strongly that the credibility and stature of the Supreme Court has crumbled as a result of Dobbs, but also other decisions, as you've just said so well, that are out of step, out of alignment with the mainstream of American thought. And they're just getting started. This term could well mean overturning the so-called Chevron deference rule. Now, mm -hmm. I know it sounds highly technical and abstruse, but what it means is your air and water is going to be less safe. The workplaces of America are going to be more dangerous experts will no longer have the kind of impact that they do right now in framing American law in the way that it impacts everyday Americans. So we're only beginning this trend. No, I, I mean, I'm glad you brought it up because I think it all swirls around in this bucket of a lack of ethics, 
a plunge. I mean, I think the Supreme Court's approval from the American public has plunged farther and faster than any group in civic life in our country's history. Since Gallup has been asking the question, I think the court has dropped 40 points, and that includes the year 2000, when many Americans viewed the court as deciding a presidential election. I mean, what do you think McConnell's legacy is when you look at the public really bordering on, on disapproval, bordering on, on disdain for the lack of ethics in this one, legis uh, one judicial body? Well, you know, Nicole, that's a really profound question because the judicial branch was supposed to be, in the words of our founders, the least dangerous. It's not elected. It's for life. And they were supposed to, in effect, be the firewall against constitutional violation, not the activist policy-making branch that they have become. And I think Americans deeply resent it at some level that these unelected lifetime judges are having this impact on their lives in a way that seems totally foreign to their values and to the daily challenges of their life. And I would say that the legacy of undermining, in fact, in some ways crippling the credibility of the court is among the most lasting malign influences and, and legacy that Mitch McConnell leaves. And the politicization of the whole nomination process, ramming through Amy Coney Barrett right before an election in which the nominee's presidential backer was defeated, in some ways is a defiance of American public opinion, again, that undermines the credibility of the court. So I think that's a pretty, pretty malign legacy.